right, well. You're on, Scott. I, this is great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, um, talk a little bit about earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest. And I want to say thank you to you guys for the work that you are doing right now in Northwest Portland and the potential liquefaction problems that you, we've got along the Willamette River. And I just say thank you, thank you, thank you. So what I want, uh, I want to do is give you a big picture of how we fit into um, earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest and not only talk about uh, uh, the great subduction zone earthquake, the big one, uh, which is of huge concern, but also the Portland Hills Fault, which runs right in back of that area um, that you guys have been working with in North Portland uh, with all of the, the tanks out there. And so uh, <clears throat> this talk is, uh, I, I label it, earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest, are we ready for the big one? So, um, so uh, we've known about the earthquakes, the big earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest, oh, uh, since back about uh, uh, 1990. But then uh, it was one article in the New Yorker that came out in 2015 by Catherine Schultz that she called the really big one that really took, uh, made people start taking notice that, whoa, we have a potential for a large earthquake here in the Pacific Northwest and we need to do something about it. In it, she said, you know, everything west of I-5 is going to be toast, which is not true, but there is some truth, little pieces. Worst disaster in American history. Hopefully we <laughs> won't get there. Uh, and 13,000, 27,000 people injured. So shelter for millions of people, food and water needed. And so that got people talking. And as a result of that, I, the number of talks that I'm giving uh, about the, the big one have increased uh, fivefold uh, every year. So let's go back in time. What is an earthquake? So when we're on the earth, the earth is moving. And the rocks are bending, bending, bending. And then when they break, that is called the focus of an earthquake. They liberate a lot of energy. And one of the major wave uh, energies are wave energies. That's the earthquake. Uh, and so the point where it breaks is called the focus. The epicenter is above that. Uh, and, and so there, there are lots of them around. Over the whole earth, every year, we have 800,000 recorded earthquakes, of which about 100,000 we actually feel. 1,000 cause damage. And major disasters occur there. Now, it's interesting for the last century, if you take all of the deaths that occurred during that whole century, we averaged 10,000 deaths per year. But between now, from 2004 until now, where we've had three subduction zone earthquakes, we're up to averaging 44,000 earthquakes a year. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about earthquakes in general, but focusing in on the subduction zone earthquakes. And I just wanted to make sure you understand all the uh, verbiage that we use. And so we always uh, uh, talk about magnitude, how much energy was released. And maybe some of you remember the spring break quake of 1993, 5.6. Uh, and, and then if you compare that to the magnitude 6.6, 6.6 is a logarithmic scale with a fudge factor thrown in. So 30 times the energy is liberated by that. If you go from 5.6 to 7.6, it is 30 times 30 or 900 times the energy. And if you go up to 8.6 from a 5.6, that's 27,000 times the energy. And that's up in the range of a subduction zone earthquake. So that's a huge amount of shaking that we will uh, uh, have from a subduction zone earthquake. And it'll be up to three to four minutes long. Um, also in magnitudes, I tell my students, if the magnitude is less than 2.5, you really aren't going to feel it, not even at the place above, directly above it. It's just too small. And, but then once you get above 5.5 in North America, you start getting damage. And so on the news, when they, they list the, the magnitude, I can say, oh, is there going to be damage or is there not going to be damage? Uh, whatever. Uh, I still remember a few years ago, Klask and I had a 1.8 earthquake. And it made page two of the Oregonian. And I said, that's crazy. I mean, a slow news day. Nobody in class can I clear everyday congestion. And, and, and so, so does somebody nope. have their microphone on? Just, okay. Um, and, and so, uh, so subduction zone earthquakes are the 
earthquakes that we have in magnitude. The last one, last century, was 1964. It was a Good Friday earthquake, 9.2, occurred up at the very, very close to Anchorage, Alaska. A lot of damage that was up there. And then we waited, the whole world waited until 2004 for the next subduction zone earthquake. And that was in Indonesia, 2004. Huge tsunami that was produced there. Went all the way up to India and Thailand. Uh, it was a 9.1. And then we waited six years, and we got another one. 8.8, .8, that was down in Chile. And I'll show you these in a second. And then only one year later, we had a 9.0 in Japan. So we waited 40 years for nothing. And then within seven years, we had three of them. And many of them around the ring of fire. We should really, uh, uh, in the Pacific Ocean, we should really call it the ring of subduction because that's where they are occurring. Indonesia, that earthquake that occurred there, fourth largest earthquake in the world since the year 1900. Two, 280,000 people died uh, and even more, th uh, 14,000 missing. And it was primarily because of the tsunamis uh, that, that, that we had there. And then 2008, when we had that earthquake down in Chile, the subduction zone earthquake, seventh largest uh, one since the seismograph was invented, 800 dead in that one. Um, and, uh, and so here's some pictures of new buildings, old buildings, destroyed, a lot of infrastructure destroyed, uh, and then a huge tsunami that went out afterwards. It occurred in the middle of the night, so we didn't get any real pictures uh, um, from that one. But that's very, it's very close to the world's fastest moving subduction zone. And just south of there in 1960, the world's largest earthquake, 9.6. Uh, and, and so very active. So you get a lot of subduction zone earthquakes down there. And I still remember very well um, the evening uh, March 11th in 2011, when we had the Tohoku earthquake in Japan, 9.0. Uh, and I was just driving home from uh, work uh, late that night, and it was just a little bit before 10 o'clock. And all of a sudden, I, the phone rang, and it was Channel 6, and they said, we just had a 9.0 earthquake off the coast of Japan. I said, oh, that's the subduction zone. Tell me the way. He actually spent the night in Channel 8's uh, television studio looking at all of the camcorder uh, and, and, and footage coming in. This is the tsunami that hit there. Uh, and so you had landslides that were produced. Old buildings were destroyed. Uh, and then other areas, fires that started. But the biggest problem was Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant. Uh, and $220 billion just from the melt, uh, melting of that. They built it, it down in the tsunami zone. They put a wall around it. They figured it would be big enough right at the top. So we, uh, and they are the most prepared country in the world. Chile and uh, Japan are the two most uh, prepared uh, uh, countries in the world, yet you had all these people that were killed. Uh, 12,000 missing. 90% of the people who died were from drowning and 190,000 buildings uh, affected as a result of this. Now, I'm going to mention just two other earthquakes. Uh, they're not subduction zone earthquakes, but we can learn a lot from them. Um, 2010, uh, January 12th, we had a 7.0 earthquake in Haiti, but 220,000 people died. Look at the, all of the buildings that collapsed. Why? Because no building codes. Actually, they do have building codes, but nobody enforces them. And so a huge number of people died there. It was shallow to the surface and building codes, very, very important. Uh, I used to live in Christchurch. So here's downtown Christchurch. I used to live out in this area here in Lincoln. <clears throat> and that was very close to the uh, epicenter for that. It was in September 10th, 2010. I actually was in New Zealand. I was on the North Island at that time. Uh, and uh, 7.1. Good news is it occurred like 4.30 in the morning. Everybody was in bed and nobody was killed. But then you uh, it had another one, uh, February 22nd, so the end of the summer for them down there. Uh, and it was right in the middle part of the day, 6.3, smaller, but 180 people were killed as a result from it. And, and Christchurch is very similar in size to Portland. One of the things is most of the buildings there were brick, unreinforced masonry. And they had huge amounts of damage because those are buildings that don't do well in earthquakes. You also had huge amounts of liquefaction. Uh, the students at the University of uh, 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 Christchurch were out, uh, and so they formed a student uh, volunteer army that would go out and shovel the streets of all the liquefied sand that came out uh, to the surface. But the biggest problem was a major tower downtown fell onto a bus with a whole bunch of uh, grade school kids, <clears throat> and then also a lot of people were killed 
uh, only for 6.3. You're probably wondering why I'm showing you uh, a chimney, because most of the chimneys in Christchurch were destroyed. Well, 90% uh, of the houses in Christchurch do not have central heating. When I moved there, they said, Scott, you're going to have to go out and get a cord of wood and a whole load of coal to heat your house uh, uh, because you heated it with different fireplaces. And if you don't have a chimney that works, you can't heat your house. The good news is it occurred just before summer. Uh, they had time to rebuild all of the fireplaces, but that was a major problem for them there. But in Christchurch, 390,000 people, kind of similar in size to Portland, but the second largest city in New Zealand, $40 billion worth of damage from that, those, those earthquakes. 60,000 houses were affected, 20,000 significant damage, and 8,000 uh, houses had to be de deconstructed, as they call it. That is torn down. And of all the 3,000 buildings, 2,400 had to be uh, torn down. Major economic uh, impact uh, on this town. They had a lot of liquefaction, but also rockfall and lateral spread moving down these sides. But the thing that we geologists forget to tell people is they had 12,000 aftershocks. Just after the first uh, earthquake that you have, you are going to be living with those. The bigger the uh, earthquake, the more aftershocks that you're going to have. It took three months to restore the water, 15 months to restore sewage. And if you don't have sewage, uh, you can't take a shower. And so everybody had to go to the central basketball pavilion. Uh, and you did you shower with everybody else in, in Christchurch because there wasn't a, you couldn't do it at home. Uh, and then they put porter products all over the city. Uh, and, and so uh, major things that we forget to tell as geologists uh, to everybody about what happens when you have earthquakes. Also, a couple of years ago, I was in Nepal. And back in the 2015, they had a 7.8 uh, magnitude. In that country of 6.6 .6 million people, 8,000 people died. It was mostly the older buildings that, that uh, were affected by that. Uh, they are becoming more and more uh, conscious about earthquakes. Uh, the geologists and the geotechnical engineers are getting together and working hand in hand to prevent uh, the deaths of the people. So wherever we are on the face of the earth, we are moving. North America, we are moving in a westerly direction two centimeters a year. Uh, in South America, they're also moving in two centimeters a year. Africa is moving off to the opposite side, away from the mid-Atlantic ridge, where new crust is being created. Magma is coming up to the surface, solidifying, and then more magma comes up, pushes the plates to the side, and it causes the plates to go in either direction. Uh, the Pacific plate is created at a ridge system at the bottom of the ocean, the South Pacific, and it's moving in a northwest westerly direction until it hits another trench up in Alaska, and one goes down underneath the other. That's called subduction. And then the Nazca plate is created down here off the coast of South America, uh, and it is the fastest moving plate in the world, and it is being subducted underneath the Andes, comes back to the surface as a chain of volcanoes, and also you get all these subduction zone earthquakes. So where you get the subduction zones, you get the big earthquakes uh, in the world today. Uh, and so off of our coast, we have a subduction zone. We have a chain of volcanoes 200 miles off of the coast called the Juan de Fuca uh, uh, volcanoes, and it's the Juan de Fuca plate. The Gorda plate is down here, a chain of volcanoes off of uh, southern Oregon and, and northern California. And they are moving in towards North America. They are being subducted underneath North America. Uh, and then they come back to the surface as a chain of volcanoes that we call the Cascade Volcanoes, all the way up to Mount Garibaldi from Mount Lassen in California. And you get these big subduction zone earthquakes. The other major fault that we have is San Andreas Fault, where the Pacific Plate is moving in a northwesterly direction. Uh, and it is uh, breaking off from uh, uh, North America, and then it comes out of the ocean at the Mendocino Fault. So here's just a cross section of the Pacific Northwest. Juan de Fuca Plate going down underneath, melting, coming back to the surface as a chain of volcanoes. But this is the subduction zone earthquakes area. Everything is, is frozen together. The plates are not passing by every day. They are building up more and more pressure, more and more pressure. And then about every 500 years, they break all the way from down to, uh, the southern part all the way to the northern part, creating a, a very, very large earthquake that we call a subduction zone earthquake over nine. Uh, and then you have earthquakes in the North American crust. We call them the crustal earthquakes uh, that we have got. Uh, and, uh, and then you also have earthquakes off in the Juan de Fuca plate, too. Uh, so those are the three types that you have got. So here's a cross-section of, of the oceanic crust, the coast range, 
the Willamette Valley and the Cascade Mountains. Now, when I moved back, so I grew up here in Oregon. I went to Beaverton High School, uh, but I teaching took me around the world for 20 years. When I came back here in 1990, I'd come from Louisiana. Here is in the textbook that I was using at that time. That was the earthquake hazard map for the United States. And yellow is basically nothing. Louisiana, Texas, and Florida, nothing down here. Now, this is the New Madrid fault zone of southern Illinois and Missouri and Arkansas and Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, but the, most of the major fault zones are here in the West. And the, these maps were based on historic earthquakes. Now what we do is we base them on the geology uh, and the geological deposits that we found here in the Northwest. Because if you go back to that one, look at the, the Seattle earthquake of 1949, I think it was, uh, was a big one. But Oregon had no big ones. We, were, we thought we did not have an earthquake problem. But then based on the tsunami deposits that we find along the coast, which I'll show you in a second, we do have a problem. We are an active subduction zone. And, and so we have new maps that you can see here. So what are the four hazards that we have from earthquakes? Number one, the ground shaking. And then many of you have probably been in an earthquake and the buildings go back and forth. Uh, also, the thicker the sediment underneath your building, the more the waves amplify. And uh, we'll talk more about that later on. Uh, also, if you're close to a river and you have high groundwater table and primarily um, sandy parent material, you guys have been working with this, you can liquefy uh, the ground and it can flow. Thirdly, if you have landslides, if you're on steep slopes and they are slightly wet, then they can reactivate. So reactivation of landslides, incredible. And then lastly, tsunamis along the coast. Uh, you, after a major subduction zone earthquake, 20 minutes later to 30 minutes later, strong chance for tsunamis. Let me just show you some examples of this. This is a picture from Taiwan. Uh, and this was a uh, earthquake. It was not a subduction zone earthquake. It was a crustal quake that was there. But the, the buildings were not built up to code and everything was destroyed and a lot of deaths that occurred here. These we have in the world come from New Zealand in Christchurch. What happens is if you've got sandy layers below the surface, like the uh, Canterbury Plains underneath uh, Christchurch, uh, and they're filled with water, they will uh, actually liquefy and go up to the surface as a sand boil. So you'll get sand boils all over the surface. And so they had sand boils all over Christchurch. And here is a little uh, car that was completely buried by sand coming out of the ground. Uh, and then the famous one that's in every one of our textbooks, Niigata, Japan, uh, 1964, that was a 7.5 earthquake. Uh, these buildings, the apartment buildings were well built, but they just tipped over. Why? Because the ground underneath them liquefied, and we are concerned about that. Here are some landslides. This is on a major highway that goes uh, from uh, Banks down to Pilgrim. This occurred in 1991. Uh, and now, it was not an earthquake generated one, it was cl uh, climatically produced, but we feel if, that if we have a subduction zone earthquake, every one of the many, every one of the ro roads that goes down to the coast will have a major landslide on it and will be uh, completely closed off. The coast has to uh, do for themselves or we're gonna be sending helicopters into the, those areas that they have got because help is not gonna come on the ground out of the Willamette Valley. So big problem. And then this is what we used to think tsunamis were looking like, a series of very, very large waves that are coming in. But in actuality, after the 2004 earthquake in Indonesia, when the camcorders in, in Thailand, we found that, no, you don't. You just have one huge wave that comes out of the ocean, and then it just rises up. Uh, uh, and this was up in Thailand. They were taking pictures there, and they, everybody said, whoa, look at that thing coming in. Whoa, not a good idea. Uh, as it comes in, let's get out of there. Uh, and, and so it, anywhere from, uh, uh, because as the waves are slowed down, as they come in, they grow uh, and two heights uh, up to 10 uh, meters in size. So along the Oregon coast now, Dogami, our state geological survey has mapped. Anytime you get above, below 50 feet elevation, uh, there's a sign that says you are entering the tsunami hazard zone. And then when you're coming out of it, they say you're exiting the tsunami hazard zone. Uh, and, and this is based on uh, deposits that 
uh, geologist, uh, Kurt Peterson, a great geologist in our department at Portland State, took his students and they mapped them all up and down the coast. Used to be they'd only find them up about 25 feet high. And then towards the end of his career, they found one 40 feet above the uh, an elevation above a back sea star. And they said, okay, we got to raise it up to 50 feet. Uh, and so in every one of the tsunami zones, there are also signs that say tsunami hazard uh, or evacuation route. And so if you are staying in a motel or a house or a lodge or something in the tsunami hazard zone, you need to know where you have to go to get above 50 feet elevation. Uh, and so if you are, and I tell people on the coast, if you are knocked to the ground, by an earthquake and it seems to go on and on and on and not and don't wait for the authorities to say that was the big one you get the high ground it was and so you need to get that you have 20 to 30 minutes to get the high ground and this is a big planning that they are doing along the coast now geologists for years have been mapping faults in oregon and that's where uh, earthquakes have occurred in the past there's an offset in the rocks and so uh and so we have the black ones we don't know when they went off so we have the foggiest idea of recurrence intervals. But then the, the, the yellow ones, the green ones, and the red ones, we actually have dates. And so we have recurrence intervals that are, are there, which is important. Uh, and if you go down into California, all of the faults are mapped. Everyone has a name. They know when was the last time it went off. Uh, what's the maximum uh, earthquake that we can expect? And what are the uh, uh, areas that, uh, to the sides? setbacks that we have to have for building on them. Uh, the, it's called the Alquist Priolo system, and they have been doing this for years and years, and there is a huge group in California of paleoseismologists and companies that will go out. If you got a fault in your area, they will uh, analyze it, and they will tell you, how do you uh, uh, build in those particular areas? Oregon, we didn't even think we were earthquake prone until 1990. Uh, uh, I mean, subduction zone earthquakes, and so we are way behind in, in, in research that is needed here. Uh, and so uh, magnitudes that we have got uh, 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 in the North American crust, we used to say 6.5. The longer a fault is, uh, the bigger the magnitude if it breaks on the whole one. Now we're up to 7.7, 7.2. We found an earthquake uh, a fault up on Mount Hood that goes from the bridge of the God's landslide up to the, the top using LIDAR. This is the, um, the laser imaging that we can see through the trees. Ian Maiden found this, and then Ashley Strike, Scott Bennett, and Ian have trenched this with our students from Portland State. And they, the date that they have got there is 4,400 years ago, which is the exact same time that the Bridge of the Gods landslide came down. So probably movement of that earthquake caused the Bridge of the Gods to come down. Out in the Juan de Fuca Plate off of the coast, uh, they have longer faults. You can get up to 7.3, and then the subduction zone over 9.0. Uh, and so a 9.0 earthquake is going to last uh, three to four minutes. The bigger the magnitude, the longer the, the time that you have got. The coast will drop in many places up to six feet. Uh, and why? Because the whole plate is rebounding 30 to 100 feet towards Japan that uh, is released during that. Unknown caller. Yeah, and then, and then, as a result of that, uh, it will produce a tsunami, and that's why the tsunami will come in 20 to 30 feet later, and 15 to 50 feet. And you'll also get lots of landslides, liquefaction, and shaking. A lot of shaking afterwards. How this be put together? Well, Brian Atwater, a great geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, he was working up in Seattle on the U UW campus. He kept driving up the Oregon, Washington coast and seeing dead trees, call them ghost forests. Uh, and, he, and if you want to know when that forest died, what you do is you get a piece of wood right underneath the bark and it will tell you when that tree died. And so he started dating these ghost forests, he started out with the Copalis River up in Washington. They all died around 300 years ago using the radiocarbon dates. And he said, whoa, something happened 300 years ago. Uh, and then also he looked at the soils on the close in a second, and he get buried soils. He uh, combined with David Yamaguchi, who looked in the uh, tsunami records, because if it was the big one, uh, it would have produced a tsunami that would have gone all the way to Japan. And the Japanese are incredible record keepers. Was there uh, records of a tsunami that hit over there? And they found one. And the Japanese had called it the, the ghost, uh, sorry, the... Uh, um, 
they, they called it, um, uh, well, they had a name for it. It was not common. Uh, and, and I'll think of it in just a second. Uh, and uh, because there was no volcanic eruption and no earthquake in Japan, but they had a large tsunami from one end of the country. It was only about a meter high. Uh, and, uh, and so orphan tsunami, they called it the orphan tsunami. And Ryan Atwater wrote a book about that and said, whoa, this is the evidence. And then here is that buried soil that is down below. He dated that to 300 feet. And so the whole coast drops. And so anytime we have a subduction zone earthquake, one of the first questions that geologists always ask to the local people is how far, how far did the coast go down and sink? Uh, because that was the result of this uh, thing. So the last subduction zone earthquake was about um, 300 years ago. Then it was 800 years ago, then 1,100 years ago, and the recurrence interval is about every 500 years. Uh, and, but then w working with Kenji Sataki uh, and, and the orphan tsunami, they figured out if you, you know, they had the date that it hit Japan. But remember, it's on the other side of the date line. So you have to work back, and then at 600 miles an hour, uh, it, we believe it, it occurred about uh, 7 to 9 o'clock at night on January 26, the year 1700. Uh, and so that was the last earthquake that we had. Uh, and so uh, the earthquake is not only going to occur along the rupture zone out here, where everything is going to go 30 to 100 feet towards Japan, but everything to the east is going to also be shaking, too, at the same time. Uh, and so uh, this guy, um, uh, Chris Goldfinger, uh, who is a pr uh, professor down at Oregon State, brilliant scientist. He's our top paleo seismologist in the state of Oregon. Uh, he went out here, and so major valleys coming out um, uh, from the, the land, uh, every time that you'd have a subduction zone earthquake, you'd get landslides on the sides, and the, those landslides would go down uh, and then come down to the bottom, and they would for, form uh, 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 a deposit on the bottom. Uh, uh, and, and, and what you do is in that deposit, you are going to have shells, and shells, you could radiocarbon date them. And so he got the sequence of all of the major earthquakes of all of these deposits off of the coast. And he had 41 different all the way from up in Vancouver Island. But from about here on north, there were a lot less and down here, twice as many. And so he had 19 of them full margin. They occurred in each one of those, but 22 additional ones down at the bottom. Uh, and then, and so uh, he believes, we believe that we have two sets of earthquakes. When they, the whole thing breaks from one end to the other, it's about every 500 years. And those are 8.7 to 9.2 earthquakes. That's what I like to call, and most of us call the big one. Uh, and the, the article in the um, um, Catherine Schultz uh, in the New Yorker, she called it the really big one. But the southern margin is twice as active every about 243 years. She called that the big one. We call it the mini big one. Uh, but this is 7.8 to 8.6. Uh, and so the whole margin breaking, it's a, compared to right now, we have a 15% chance in the next 50 years. But just the southern margin with an 8.0 earthquake is 37% in the next 50 years. And so we might see a big, big earthquake in the next 50 years here. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is, uh, with the, uh, we can have an early warning system if it breaks in the southern part. Uh, and so we have two apps that are out there. We now have Shake Alert, which is still in the latter stages of uh, testing. And this will tell you that a uh, large earthquake has occurred and you need to duck cover and hold. And then after shaking stops, get the higher ground if you're along the coast. Uh, and then every year in June, Starting in 19, 2016, we, we started having Cascadia rising. So all of the, the police departments, fire departments, uh, medical people, and the National Guard came out and started practicing, how are we going to respond to Cascadia? We do this every year in June. Now it's every other year. But then every year, October 16th at 1016 in the morning, we have the great Oregon and Washington shakeouts. Now it's just called the great shakeout. We do it around the world. Uh, and what do we do? All the schools have earthquake drills uh, that are going on at that time. So with an early warning system, so um, if, if the whole thing breaks from one end to the other, we're going to have maybe five to 10 seconds. Uh, your phone will start buzzing, and then 
you duck cover and hold and that's all. But if it's Southern Oregon, you have five, three to four to five minutes to get out of the building. You can shut down the railroads. You can shut down the power plants. You can get people outside of the buildings. Hospitals can stop the operation. Sorry, dude, I got to sew you up because of earthquakes on the way. You can get people out of the elevators. Fire doors can go up at the fire stations and get vehicles off the bridge. So the early warning system with the shake alert is very close for us, uh, especially for the southern market. You can design buildings too. Transamerica building down in uh, San Francisco is on base isolation. The earth will move underneath it, but the building will not. And it's, it's, it's look, you got all the counterbalances up here. Uh, the uh, structural engineers just get very excited about buildings like this. Uh, and and so, so we know about earthquakes. We're trying to get us all prepared in the Pacific Northwest. But the problem we have is 75 in Oregon, 75% of the structures are not, not designed for the mega thrust earthquake. So millions of buildings are going to be compromised. Uh, right now, 3,000 schools are, would be compromised. Half of the buildings, uh, not quite 15 out of 17, this few have been repaired, uh, would be compromised. Third of our fire stations, half the police stations, and two-thirds of the buildings in the western half of the, the state of Oregon. So we have a problem. And so in Portland, for instance, they are closing down a, a high school every year and build, building it for earthquake standards. Many of them were the old brick buildings. Now, how long will we recover? I showed you some examples from Christchurch. City says it'll be one to three months for everybody to get uh, electricity back. Uh, now, the Portland Water Bureau is very proactive. They say it'll only be one month. Uh, and uh, now I showed you how long it was for Christchurch to come back. Sewer, six months. I mean, that's a long time without you know, uh, having showers. And highway, six months. Remember the aftershocks that you've got. And... Uh, we will pay about 75% of the damage as a result of this. Um, so important ideas to take home. I encourage everybody to get earthquake insurance. I've got it on my house. I'm on bedrock. It's only five feet down. But I, the most expensive thing that I've got is my house. And if it's knocked off of the foundation, it is toast. They just bulldoze it. Uh, Washington is more prepared to, than us uh, because they had – they started having this emergency responses a lot earlier because they had that 1950 earthquake that showed that they had, could get large earthquakes up there. Uh, now, the infra infrastructure, huge uh, distance to go. Uh, and, and the codes only changed in 1994. So we really need to uh, get our uh, bridges. I-5 and I-84 uh, and I-205 are the first bridges to uh, get done in Oregon, and then uh, Highway 101, they're working with this. Big questions to always ask is, you, are you prepared at home? And then do you have a neighborhood plan? Because in case of the big one, uh, the first responders are going to be you to your neighbors and your neighbors to you. And then one thing that I'm on the state board of uh, Red Cross, and we, for about four or five years, did seminars on getting businesses to be prepared. Get a resilience plan because you don't want your business to fail. You want it to be up and running as soon as possible afterward. I showed you how many businesses, uh, buildings were destroyed down in Christchurch. Uh, Intel has started doing their resilience plan about eight years ago. They said after a subduction zone earthquake, they can be making chips uh, within a week afterwards. And, and so we don't want businesses to go out of business. We want them to be prepared and have plans. And also have all the people that are supplying things to you to have plans for this. Now, earthquakes, we can't predict them yet, but we're hopeful that we will be able to respond to them well. I always put in about houses on stilts. People always say, what do you think about those? Well, I would not live in a house like that because what will happen is it will vibrate at two different rates. You have the rate that is on the stilts, uh, which is on a fulcrum, and the other end is attached to the soil, and they will vibrate at two different rates. Now, lower earthquakes, those houses will stand. But at high earthquakes, they will not stand up and they'll vibrate and fall apart. So I, I would not live in a house like that. How can you get prepared at home? Uh, Red Cross has a list. Just go to redcross.org uh, and ask for the disaster plans. But lots of food, we're saying uh, two to four weeks worth of food and water that is there. Oh. I always tell people to get a, a California valve, a gas shutoff valve, if you have natural gas. Because if you are away from the house and the, uh, it doesn't shut off automatically, your house may fill up with gas and then you may have a, a fire problem. Uh, now a lot of strap on the water heaters. 
in the state of Oregon. But if yours is old, you may want to get a strap down. You want to strap your house down for, for, to the foundation. Uh, be, and so there is a company, there are a whole bunch of them. Earthquake Tech was one of the first ones. They'll come out and, and look at your house. You want to have your house strapped to the foundation. It will lower your uh, uh Insurance fees, but at the same time, it will preserve your house. And then next to your ha uh, bed, I have a flashlight, no shoes, just in case. Uh, we, you have a lot of broken, it occurs in the, mid uh, in the night, and you, there's a lot of broken glass. And then get insurance. And then also, I, I tell people, toilet paper and also pills, and also have some cash. Uh, and and so, uh, so what are the kids doing wrong in this particular uh, figure here? Because now they do earthquake drills. You duck cover, but you're also supposed to hold on because the desks will be moving around after that. So, so that is the story that I have for uh, earthquakes in Oregon, past, present, and future. We need to get prepared not only for the um, subduction zone earthquakes, but also for the others. Uh, I, did, uh, I didn't have in this one, uh, presentation about the Portland Hills Fault. Portland has uh, three major faults, but the biggest one goes right at the base of the West Hills or the Tualatin Mountains, starts up at Rainier and Scappoose and comes right down uh, through eastern, uh, western part of Portland uh, all the way out into the Clackamas River drainage. Uh, and, and now based on the size of that, uh, we believe it could produce up to a 7.2 earthquake. And that could possibly cause some liquefaction in addition to the, the big one. Uh, the subduction zone earthquake. And so um, those particular possibilities are out there uh, for um, earthquakes in the future. Um, and so back in 2011, the state legislature said, we need to prepare for this and put a resilience plan together for the state of Oregon. And so I was one of about 150 people on this committee of geologists and engineers, structural engineers, geotechnical engineers looking at all of this. And we said, what are the, the top 10 problems that we're here? Number one is the area that your group is looking at, and those are the tank farms that are out there in northeast uh, northwest Portland. It's all a lot of it's dredged soil that are there, sand ground water tables, and uh, and so that's a prime for liquefaction. Number two were the a lot of the bridges, and number three were the schools. We're, uh, we're slowly taking that, that to heart and as money becomes available, taking care of that. So that is a good place to, to stop. And so uh, maybe there might be a few questions or comments. We have a lot of good people who are watching here. Uh, so any questions or comments that we have got? Scott, you said you should put a, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, you said you should put a, um, an automatic shutoff valve on your gas uh, gas line, incoming gas line. Is that right? That's right. And I mean, it's a law in California. Really? Uh, I know uh, some people that have done it here. but And I did. I did it. And I tell all my friends that if you've got gas in your house, um, the actual valve is not that uh, expensive. Uh, it comes out about uh, three to five hundred dollars, and uh, used to be only the gas company did it. Now uh, most heating and cooling companies will do it. Uh, the reason it, it is so expensive is you have to turn off all your pilot lights in your house, uh, and then then you put the valve in, you turn off the gas, put the valve in, and then you have to go back and relight all of the pilot valves, uh, mm -hmm. and so it, it's a little more expensive there. But uh, I've got it. Where do you purchase that? Uh, you get in touch with the heating and cooling companies, and most of them, they will uh, they will um, put it in for you. And uh, my neighbor is one guy that does that. He did mine. Hmm. Better said, yet, switch to electricity and solve two problems. Right. Be sustainable and get rid of gas. <laughs> that that get, is true. Get rid of frack gas, because that's what it really is. I also, how... Um, is there any movement to getting rid of these tank farms, relocating them from uh, uh, north uh, east Portland, northwest? Uh, Portland? It, it has been a problem. We've known about this. May May Wong or you May Wong with Dogami, uh, she really got uh, uh, talking about this uh, uh, starting about ten years ago, and then 
I put it into my lectures and Chris Goldfinger did. So all of us who were doing uh, earthquake uh, lectures started talking about more people got more and more concerned. And governments, it's in the city, it's in the city of Portland. But uh, the, um, the, the comp there are like 10 different companies that own all of these pipelines and, mm -hmm. and tank farms. It's not just one company. And, and all of them seem to find ways of getting out. And they say, who, is, who has ju jurisdiction? Is it DEQ? And DEQ has tried and they have failed. We really haven't had the strong leadership in DEQ in more recent years. Uh, the mayor of Portland has tried in the past. The governor has tried. Um, Office of Emergency Management. And uh, it just hasn't happened. And I still... Uh, Jack and I are in the same uh, Rotary Club, and I still remember a few years ago, we had a speaker from one of the tank farms. He was a national company, uh, and, and he said, we were not going to move unless we are told by somebody who has authority to make it, it's going to cost us money. And we, uh, our responsibility are to our stockholders, not the people of Portland. He's told us right in front of uh, uh, our responsibility to stockholders. And, and so these companies are going to have to spend more money. Now, I think it's smart because if we do have that, I, I think that they should diversify and put some on bedrock, maybe on the other, uh, other side of the fault, far away, or in Vancouver or North Portland, far away. And I think that it, it, it would happen. So um, there are solutions out there. Uh, and actually, the um, uh, Civil Engineering Department of Portland State is working on solidifying those soils uh, using um, uh, algae and, and, and microorganisms. And they actually have a beta testing site out at the airport and then also uh, just north of the tank farms. Uh, and it is, they've had some very, very good positive things. They brought in T-Rex, the big shaking machine from down in Texas, and mm -hmm. they did the uh, uh, sample runs last summer. And we need to stabilize our airport. Uh, uh, in Tohoku, in Japan, their airport was open one week later after that subduction zone earthquake. Why? Because they had stabilized the whole runway, the main runway on that airport. We need to do that too in Portland to have planes coming in and out. Is our airport in the liquefaction zone? Yes, it's right next to a river. It's, uh, the good news is it has a little more silt than sand, but it, it still has a lot of sand liquefiable. Thank you. Thank you. How did they stabilize it in Japan, Scott? Um, they do. Uh, they basically just have huge Piling. rods that are going to pour concrete rods down. Very, very expensive and labor intensive. But it worked. One week mm -hmm. later, it was open. Mm. And Port of Portland knows all about this. And they, they say, we, that's a high on our priority list. That's why they are helping fund. Uh, Portland State, Portland State University of Arizona, and uh, University of Texas are working on that huge project. Hmm. So it looks like PGE is uh, uh, pushing uh, solar with uh, power walls. Is that uh, possibly part of this resilience? Uh, yes, and I'm very proud of PGE uh, because they are very proactive out there uh, and, and they're very decisions are not being uh, made unless they ask the earthquake question and I think that that is uh, that's very good Northwest Natural is also you know they got pipelines all over and they are taking all of that into consideration too and we've done some projects at Portland State for them uh, they're cognizant the BPA Bonneville Power they're doing this they're doing a huge project which I'm also a consultant on right now um, and uh, shoring up all of their facilities and especially their towers that they have got. Um, everybody's worried about it. And it's good that we're now being worried about it and doing something because for years and years, we never thought of Oregon as earthquake country. Um, I have a question about uh, individual houses. Um, so there's, there's a lot of houses that were built on 1920s uh, concrete and it's, it's known to be sort of uh, a pile of rocks and, I'm wondering, you know, that's that's a lot of housing stock that even if you were to strap your house to the concrete foundation, it's really not going to help you much. Um, what what types of talk has been going on about supporting people that may not be able to afford to repour their foundation? Yes, and, and, and Jennifer, you you've nailed it. 
And these companies that will come around and, and look at your houses, generally houses uh, built before 1930, the quality of the concrete is really poor. And, uh, uh, and, and, <laughs> and I tell people, you know, if you're looking at an old house, your foundation is going to be your real problem that you have got. And, and so what they have to do basically, is, Jennifer, as you mentioned, you have to come in and repour the foundation and then you can strap the house and those older houses are all wood. So that's good. Uh, but the foundation is awful. And I've been in houses like that and you can just take a pocket knife and just uh, grind right into, it. I mean, it's just almost like sand. Mm -hmm. um, and they just didn't know how to make concrete in those particular days. And, uh, then there, and there were no regulations uh, too. So that is a big problem. Uh, and, and so down the road, I, I am sure that there will be maybe special loans that will go out to people that can't afford. I mean, there are, you are right, in Portland, all, all up and down Oregon, Western Oregon, we have a lot of older houses. Uh, and, um, and so you can't strap it down to a foundation that is not good. So you have to rebuild. And so they will always tell you that uh, when they, they come out to evaluate your house. You got to rebuild the foundation. It's very expensive. But they, actually, I, I talked to one of the guys at Earthquake Tech, and they, they are, the price of rebuilding the foundation is going down, and they are, they're finding ways of trying to save some money. So, uh, But it's still expensive. Good point. Mm -hmm. um, is there something that uh, I've heard talk that the uh, – I live in North Portland on the bluff. Yes. And I've heard talk that the bluff – the entire bluff, the entire peninsula is just going to go down the river to the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> what do you think about that assessment? And I love that. And, and so asking a geologist like that, what we do is we look for landforms that show that that has happened in the past. Uh, and so uh, remember, we've had these subduction zone earthquakes every 500 years. Uh, and and so, uh, so we should see huge number of landslides of those bluffs going down one after another after another. And I've heard it for the West Hills. I mean, there was one scenario I read about 10 years ago. And the guy, he said, you know, Council Crest and everything is just going to come right down into Portland. No, there's no, there are no landslides out there showing that. Um, and, and, and so, no, I don't, I don't think that we will see that. Now, in North Portland, which is Alameda Ridge, uh, is very interesting because those are deposits, coarse grain, gravels, and cobbles from the Missoula flood. We call it a pendant bar, Alameda Ridge pendant bar. There is it; it's well drained, uh, and and so we find very very few landslides except on the western edge, like above Swan Island and the University of Portland, and out there, and those are mo mostly climatically. Um, uh, generated and when they uh, and we probably had some tiny ones in the past from earthquakes the good news is they're shallow they're thin they're not huge big ones if we had had them every 500 years we wouldn't have any bluffs out there anymore and so uh, but we uh, we tell people <laughs> have a good setback from those bluffs in North Portland on Alameda Ridge um, because um, back in 1996 we had uh, four or five feet, feet of re moving back, and and those are climatic, and you'll get very probably similar with the earthquakes. Good question. Walt, do you have a question? Might you may be on mute. No, I don't. Have a question. Sorry. All right, you just came up. I I think there's some questions on the chat. Oh, could somebody read the chat questions? Maybe I can. Yeah, I think I could read it. Uh, um, where do we find those contractors who could come inspect the house and uh, give us some estimate or? earthquake resiliency um, measures. And I'm sorry, I did not notice that my phone was not muted, so hopefully I didn't make too much noises. Okay, no, no, not a problem. So um, um, all you have to do is um, um, Google um, uh, earthquake um, hazard uh, mitigation or uh, earthquake construction in houses, something like that. The company that I do a lot of work with is called Earthquake Tech. 
they that's all they do is come out do a free inspection of your house uh, uh, and then um, uh, and they will tell you exactly what you need and uh, so I had them come out and do my house because my house is built in 89 uh, and uh, and and so I was lucky because the guy that built my house uh, actually did tie downs it was tied down because it was not required until mid 90s uh, to have the uh, tied down so um, the guy who built my house did a great job. So uh, Earthquake Tech is a good place to start. And I'm sure if you, you Google them, uh, you'll have a whole bunch of other companies that are very, very similar. There are about four or five or six major ones in Portland. And I can't remember the names of some of the others. Yeah, I just Googled them and assumed their website is hacked. <laughs> when I click on their website, I get some Windows stuff. But I'll look good. Thank, thank you, Mike. Good. Scott, one other question was, Following up on the previous question, much of the PDX airport is basically built on several to dozens of vertical feet of film material with floodplain sediments below that. The yeah. building has massive pilings, but the runways are probably toast in a big earthquake, and those will be vital in a major uh, in a major disaster recovery. How big does an earthquake have to be to cause liquefaction, liquefaction in an area like that? The subduction zone earthquake will be big enough. And then that is why the Port of Portland has said that's all, that's one of their number one uh, uh, priorities is to set, to really strengthen that at least one runway. You get keep one runway open. And it's going to be expensive because it, to do that, you are going to have to close that runway down. And, and so they, they keep both of those major runways. Of course, they have a couple diagonal ones too, which they could uh, run in between. But uh, it's a major, major thing, but they say we got to do that. And and so when you build on fill or you build on on the floodplain deposits, you have problems. And they they know that, and they they're working with they 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 built a new parking garage out at uh, PDX, and uh, they took that into consideration. And the foundation was extra. I mean, the the pilings were extra deep on that one because of the liquefaction po problem. So. On a, um, because brick and stucco buildings are so vulnerable, would it still make sense to do, to strap them down if the foundation is solid? No, uh, no, and that's a great question. And, and so those big, big problem that we have got. And I'm hoping with time that we will um, uh, reduce those, but we have some beautiful old ones. Now you can go in and turn a, uh, one of those buildings into something that is earthquake resilience, but it's very, very expensive. And you, you basically have to build a structure inside of that. Uh, and, and so, um, and there are uh, 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 geotechnical engineers out there that can do that. And they, they have done that and I've seen it happen. Uh, but you have to say, is it worth it to keep this old, older structure or, um, or not? And, and so many of our schools in Portland are brick buildings. Yeah. And, we're, and, and then also a lot of the churches, especially in the, the in North Portland, yeah, and the, what used to be African-American communities also are in trouble and there's no money there to rebuild those things. And so we're being faced with all of these decisions that are not only a geotechnical uh, question, but also uh, where's the money gonna come from? and a big big problem now you you see some buildings today that are brick on the outside but it, it's structurally not brick uh it is a concrete building with a rebar in it but then brick is just on the outside for show and and so um and and franz rod at portland state with his students did a, a complete inventory of all of portland and and how many brick buildings do we have how, how many other types of buildings and we have over a couple thousand buildings in portland that just pure brick, big problem. And eventually it will take time. And I'm hoping that I do not see a subduction zone earthquake in my lifetime, at least, especially the big one. But you know, the 8.0 in Southern Oregon, I think there's a chance for that. So uh, we'll have to see. Uh, Scott, uh, yeah, you had mentioned to me of another presentation you gave at one o'clock. No, I just did one at 11. So it was before. Oh, okay. That. Yeah. So no. All so right. I'm 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 done. I'm gonna uh, have a nice 
drink of something afterwards. <laughs> the first one was like 393 people with the Smithsonian coast to coast. Wow. Uh, and then, and I was having technical problems, uh, mm -hmm. but we, 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 we got it all in. So it worked out great. Right. Right. Is, does that Southern Oregon earthquake affect us up here? I know the big one does, but. Yes, it's a great question. It does. Uh, and but and, and it'll cause huge amount of shaking and it'll knock us to the ground. But we will have three to four to five minutes beforehand. And so that that app on your phone called Shake Alert, which I've downloaded, and you might want to download. It's, it's free to download. Um, it will actually give us time, and it, it'll say earthquake on the right now. It will just say earthquake is on the way. Duck cover and hold. Okay. Uh, but uh, eventually, in another year, they'll have the equipment. They'll say, earthquake on the way, epicenter is southern Oregon. You have three to five minutes to get out of the building. Hmm. That is what is going to save lives. Uh, and, and, and so that, that's the next stage in the development of Shake Alert. This is a combination of U.S. Geological Survey, University of Oregon, University of Washington, uh, uh, and then the federal government um, putting that all together. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that we have it, but we, we just need two more years uh, to, to get it so it will tell us exactly where it occurred. So I'm a little confused about one thing. You know, duck and cover or get out of the building. I live in a two-story stucco building and I don't want to be here. So am I better off in the street? Well, with this new shake alert, it will tell you, you have three to five minutes to get out of the building. It, it will tell you that, get out of the building. But uh, right now we don't know where it is. So you duck cover and hold. But if, if it's duck, it says duck cover and hold and it still hasn't hit, like 30 seconds later, I, if it was me, I would get out of the building. And then as you get to the door, actually look up above if, if there's any shaking to see if anything is coming down, get away from the building. So we're in this, uh, you know, this period of time where it isn't 100% complete. It's partially complete, but not 100%. So we're, right now we're still saying duck cover and hold. Now, Chris Goldfinger, who I mentioned in the Oregonian a couple of weeks ago said, you know, um, uh, I, I don't, if I was in a unreinforced masonry building, I don't know if I would duck cover and hold. I would want to get out of it because the whole thing, some of those do. Uh, that you have to to ask yourself. Uh, it's just a stucco building. I don't think it's not a problem. But uh, if it's a 1890 brick building that's never been reinforced, then uh, there's a problem there. Great. Scott, I was going to give a, just a brief update on where we are with the Zenith Energy Terminal. And if you don't thank mind, you, Jack. Yeah. Yep, thank you. Um, See if we can get this to work. Uh, Jack, while you're putting that up. Here we go. I just want to say to everybody, if you want a professional development, or please email me at mikeunger at comcast.net, and uh, we'll send you a PDH form. I just, Scott, that was so interesting. I am so glad I joined in and listened. That was really, really helpful. Thank you. Well, you're very nice to say that. And I enjoy giving this talk because we inform the public, number one, and we save lives. And that, as a geologist, that's what I want to do. I also do this with radon, too, which is the, the gas that comes out of the ground. And um, so, um, and, and we want people to um, be worried, you know, worried about the environment that they're in. Okay, Jack, you take it away. All right, thank you very much. If we talk about the tank farms, the largest concentration of fuel tanks in Portland is actually the Zenith Energy Terminal. Um, people may have read uh, some things in the newspaper to make them think that the problem is resolved. It is not. In August, uh, the city council did not certify Zenith Energy's uh, fuel terminal, um, complied with uh, standards, the next day, Zenith Energy announced it would appeal with the State Land Use Board. DEQ then turned down Zenith Energy's fuel terminal air quality permit based on the city's uh, decision. 
However, discussions with the staff of Commissioners Rubio and Ryan, they have expressed concern or the attorneys for the city uh, have expressed concern that Zenith Energy will uh, win their appeal. Zenith Energy on their website on the 27th of October said they plan to invest $35 million to expand their facilities and they plan to use uh, expand it for biodiesel and renewable diesel. Um, realize the facility is on an earthquake liquefaction zone. And our position as ESF is we oppose it for a multitude of reasons, whether it is fossil fuels, biofuels, they are, or highly flammable liquid is on a site that's an earthquake liquefaction zone. And it's as a, uh, adjacent to the Willamette River. To understand the impact of what something like this could have, we've got to realize it is a major city. It's located in an earthquake liquefaction zone. The analogs that we've documented based on the different types of fuels are significantly smaller, but are devastating in some of these areas just as well. And fuel storage and rail, uh, rail car proximity to the Willamette River. This is a uh, spreadsheet that we've got a more in-depth presentation, but time won't permit. This is initially what they were doing is importing the oil from Canada, diluted bitumen, and a 1 million gallon spill uh, on the Kalamazoo River resulted in the entire river being closed for two years and partially closed for another three to four years. And the cost to clean up uh, as of 2014 was 1.4 billion. I believe the cost, final cost is closer to two. Volatile oil like Bakken, 2 million gallon uh, collision in a rail car. And again, the oil into Zenith is brought in by a rail car was 2 million gallons up in Quebec. Uh, and 47 people were incinerated along with the buildings. The blast radius was 2,000 feet. That was 2 million gallons. And Zenith Energy actually holds over, over 60 million gallons. So you can ratio that up and just say the devastation in the region would be significant. And then biofuel ethanol rail car in Iowa, just 50,000 gallons, immediately went in, 40, uh, went into the uh, river. It was a spill of 42 miles, it caught fire and it wiped out all the marine life and created over $2 million in damage just from the dead fish and the contamination and the pollution into the water table is significantly more significant. So we are continuing to give our presentations to city officials, state officials, and uh, hopefully we can get more collaborative effort. When we've talked to the city council, their biggest concern is <laughs> jurisdiction authority. Uh, what we want to do, and we're gonna meet with a state senator by Zoom this Friday is to talk about ways we can bring all the parties together to collaborate to solve the problem. But this is a major problem and to be candid, when I've talked to people uh, around the world in the United Kingdom, in Houston, Texas, and in Southeast Asia in major export centers, they would quite candidly say their cities and their country would not allow something like this to be set up. Our lack of jurisdiction, our lack of understanding of fossil fuels basically allowed Zenith Energy to come in and set this operation up. And it is a uh, risk to our city, which if we think the uh, earthquake <laughs> The big one is a risk. This is a multiplier, and it could be set off by something significantly smaller. We have to realize, too, in the city of Houston or in the port of Houston, they have 20 major export uh, facilities and refineries. And even by major responsible companies, they average one major fire and explosion every two to three years. Now, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the clock is going to happen much sooner than just a earthquake at some point in time in the future. So that's all we have, and we will continue to push along forward. Jack, where is the uh, where where is the appeal with Luba right now? Where where are we with that? I, I don't have that information on where the status is with the appeal, uh, but I'm going to meet with one of the senators, uh, state senators. It's in the facility is in her district or next to her district. And uh, that's one of the things that we hope to do is to meet with the DEQ and to uh, bring different groups together to facilitate this. We, we have uh, people that are focusing, in my opinion, a very narrow, what is my authority of limitation? But to be fair, the city of Portland is faced with many challenges right now. And I'm sure their focus is on the ones that 
create the most noise. And so because there isn't a catastrophe yet, uh, this isn't the highest priority. Just one more, one more thing, Jack. Um, there was I, initially back in August, of course, there was a lot of fear that uh, Zenith would sue the city of Portland. Is that still hanging over their head? I think that'll depend on the action. I think that's one of the issues that they're concerned about as well, but their initial concern or greatest concern is that uh, they're going to the appeal process through the state uh, land use board. And if they win the appeal, then they can go back to the state and ask for an air quality approval. Thank you. But there are things that we could recommend that from what I can tell are well within the jurisdiction of the state the county and the city that would make it uh, challenging for Zenith Energy to continue to operate. Let's hope. Let's hope. Hey, Jack, that was a great presentation. Thank you. Could you send me a copy of your little PowerPoint? Because I'd love sure. to have all those. And, I'll, and you... I'll send you the full, uh, the more comprehensive one that gives some more analog examples. That, that, that's wonderful because uh, jurisdiction is the, the bottom line that they all these companies uh, are talking about. Who's who's is who's control? Who's decision making? Is it the city? Is it the county? Is it G, uh, EPA? Uh, who is in charge? And uh, and, um, and or is it the governor? So uh, we'll have to see. Great job! Thank you, and thank you for all of you guys doing this because it is a huge, huge problem. Thank you, Scott. Your presentation was exceptional as always. I, is there any way, Jack, that I could get uh, this? I would love to have this. Can I give the my email to Mike, Michael, or? Yeah, just give your emails to Michael, and uh, I'll send Michael an updated version that we plan to show uh, Senator uh, this coming Friday. That'd be terrific. Thank you so okay. much. Well, thank you, Scott. It's much appreciated the time you spent with us and. Jack, your update is uh, uh, informative. I appreciate that. All right. Well, yeah. I need to go, so thank you very much, and uh, we'll be in touch and go from there. Very good. Terrific. Thank you for thank you all. Really thank excellent. You. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation. You bet. You bet. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. It worked out. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, Mike, you still there? I am indeed. You bet. Yeah, that was very good. It was excellent. It would be good to hear the one on radon too, which is a. Uh, something he's well versed in and has given talks on before we might book him for for one of those we'll have to make a note of that we had 55 people here so that was a lot of people interested in the big one yeah i didn't how many people were in attendance did you see 55 or were there really okay i wasn't aware there were that many yeah, the biggest before we ever had was, I think, 35. So. Uh -huh. All right, Tracy. Hi there, Tracy. How are you? <laughs> uh, you might have logged off. Maybe so. I see the picture of it. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess. Well. I need